pleasant good night to each and every one. I greet you all in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us all stand as we begin our Wednesday night prayer and Bible study. At this time, we'd like to sing this song at the cross. I'm sure you know in this time, uh, Easter, it talks about the cross and at that cross where Jesus went and gave his life a ransom that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. Song number 94 in your hymn. Oh, yeah. 
to come here, Lord Jesus, who are being transport by the Spirit, there, Lord Jesus, that you bring them in there, God, to provide for them and give them a child and mercy. We ask there, Lord Jesus, that you just anoint the service tonight, there, Lord Jesus. We pray, there, God, for the song with that, the musicians, the backups, there, Lord, you bless their voices as they sing sweet praises unto you, there, Lord Jesus. May it be acceptable to your sight, there, Lord Jesus, and for your will this evening, there, Lord Jesus. May it go forth, there, Lord Jesus, with all power and authority, there, Lord Jesus. As you bless our hands, in that you're there, dear God, we pray, dear Lord, that you will be receptive, dear God, and that your will, dear Lord, will fall on full time around this evening, and it will be a fruit in the lives of your people here, dear Lord. We just thank you, dear Lord, for all those who are here tonight, dear Lord Jesus. We pray, dear God, that you will give them that double portion, dear Lord. We have many, dear Lord Jesus, who have come with various needs here tonight, dear God, and we just commit them into your hands, dear Lord Jesus. We pray, dear God, that you will. Just provide the answers, dear Lord, for all the prayers that will be going up here tonight, dear God. Tonight, dear Lord, we just welcome your Holy Spirit in this place, and we just ask that you take charge and you take control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I saw a sign of his crosses all the way to Calvary. He went for me. He died to set me free. Without spot. The preaching of the cross 
and to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. reading of God's word at this time I'd like to welcome Amy who will bless our holy song. strength, the joy of the Lord is truly our strength. You know, when our physical strength fails us, we can depend and we can lean on God because He, you know, He is all powerful and He is mighty and we can trust Him tonight.
let me have fully enjoy the worship this evening. I want to uh, share with you uh, from the New Testament a passage that we have been looking at uh, from Sunday, uh, both of the services, Luke chapter 19, Triumph or Tragedy. And tonight we'll be reading from verses 41 through verses of 46, 41 through verses of um, 46. While we're getting that, I just want to recognize again uh, our Easter corner. And so from having a Palm Sunday corner, now we have moved on to Easter itself. And so it's looking beautiful, it's looking wonderful. We want to say thank you to the hard workers for doing that project and also for uh, Anna and her team for decorating the inside as we are getting ready for Good Friday and Easter Sunday morning and evening. Great things happening at Power and Science Ministries. We want to encourage you to bring out your family for these very special services. And so again, brethren, you all are encouraged to go to the corner Easter corner and uh, you can uh, look at it and also take some pictures and you can and post it up all right God bless you all right so let's read on this evening from verses 41 I want to ask you to read with me are we there all right let's read and when he was come there and beheld the city and wept over it saying if thou hast known even thou at least in this thy day the things which belong unto thy peace. But now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, and thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave to thee one stone upon another, because thou livest not the time of thy visitation. This is 45. And when he was come into the temple, he began to cast out them that sold therein, and them that brought. Verse 46, saying unto them, It is written, My house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Let us bow in prayer. Father, uh, we thank you, dear Lord, for everyone that is present in the sanctuary and those that are viewing online. We thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for this special day. Dear Father, we are in the Passion Week, the middle, the middle of it, dear Father. And as we have been looking at the events uh, from Sunday, what happened as Jesus rode in triumphantly uh, to Jerusalem, as people lay their palm branches and lay their uh, cloaks on, on the ground, and uh, everybody was crying, the crowd, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, even the children, too, cried out, uh, Hosanna, blessed uh, be uh, blessed be the name of the Lord. And Jesus said, even the stones, they too will, will, will shout. And their Father, we pray that you would bless, Lord, uh, the studies on what in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. you. May have your seats. Well, before we continue on the message, triumph or tragedy, here is a little bit of humor. So, how we said that they are literally driving us mad with the corona. He said, take for instance, I went to the bathroom at the restaurant. I washed my hands and then I opened the door with my elbow. He said, I raised the toilet seat with my foot. I switched on the water faucet with a tissue and then I opened the bathroom door to leave with my elbow. And when I returned to my table, I realized I forgot to pull up my pants. <laughs> that is pressure. <laughs> that is pressure. Well, we are continuing by looking at it was tragic that the temple had to be cleansed. Verses 45. But Jesus went into the temple and he began to cast out them that sold therein and them that brought. 
that folks uh, was something indeed that was tragic. Jesus said that, listen, it is written, my house is the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You must understand the temple, what it represented. You must understand how significant the temple was during that time. It was the center of Jewish worship. It was majestic in its appearance. And it should have been the most precious place for God's people. That is what it should have been. Even now too, the house of God should be precious to one and all. A place that we can congregate and we can worship. A place that we can praise the name of Jesus. But the Bible tells us that Jesus went in and he took a look around. And what he saw in the temple actually sickened him. In Mark chapter 11 and verses 11, we read how Jesus keenly observed what was taking place. He looked around and so the hallowed place of worship had turned into a marketplace by vendors, unscrupulous vendors. And so they were actually robbing the people, charging exorbitant uh, prices for the exchange of money so that they can purchase uh, sacrifices that they would offer. And so, I mean, it was very sickening to, to the Lord. But just for uh, a moment, uh, um, as you would, as it would close your eyes and try to see what was happening through the heart of Jesus himself, uh, you knew that you had to do something. Jesus knew that. He couldn't leave the temple as it was. He had to act. He had to send a message, a clear message about the desecration that was taking place. How people were dishonoring his father's house, the house of, of God. And so Jesus knew that he had to do some cleanup. He had to take some drastic actions. So we read that it was not that day itself, the Sunday, the triumphant entry of the Lord, but it would have been the following day. It would have been the Monday that Jesus uh, would return to Jerusalem and uh, he would look at the temple and he would begin now to clean up the temple. I could imagine it was difficult for him even to sleep that night, that Sunday night, as he thought about what he must do the following day. And so he went into the temple and the Bible tells us that he drove out the money changers. He drove out those that were selling doves and so on. He was through the tables. He made a whip. And so he used that whip to drive out those that were desecrating the temple of the Lord. So there are a number of things that we learn from the actions of, of Jesus. The first thing that we learn is that we must give proper reverence to the house of God, proper reverence to the presence of God, because um, this house of God is the place that we have come to worship Him. And freedom in worship does not mean that we do anything that we want to do. Freedom in worship does not mean to say that we carry about ourselves in any manner at all. We must always have reverence for the house of God and respect for the house of God. Amen, somebody? Amen. Secondly, the Bible tells us that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19. And so we must ask ourselves continuously, all right, that if this temple that God has given unto us, if it need cleansing. So not only does the physical place of worship that we gather together needs to be cleansed, needs to be holy, all right, needs to be, um, we need to respect that place, but also our bodies have become the temple of the Spirit of God, 
And so we need to examine ourselves and ask, are there any areas that need cleansing in our lives? You see? And so we need to, during this week in particular, to do some reflection and look at, at ourselves. Because many times what we do is that um, we always, you know, look at others uh, and we sort of uh, judge others. Uh, but folks, uh, we should be looking at ourselves this week, especially this week, uh, and says, Lord, uh, is my temple clean? Is my temple holy? Is it a place that the Holy Spirit can truly be glorified? And God can be glorified uh, through me. The story is told about a distinguished pastor of um, a distinguished church uh, in New York City. And so Dr. Mark B. Babcock was approached by a physician, actually a member of the congregation, who was concerned about um, his health. So handing Dr. Babcock some theatre tickets, uh, he said, uh, take these and you need to get some, you know, recreation, some relaxation. So here are some tickets because I see, Pastor, that you're working very hard. You need to have a time of, you know, to relax yourself. And so I have purchased some tickets for you to go to a play. So the pastor looked at the tickets and seeing that the tickets that was offered, all right, he could not conscientiously accept these tickets and go to that particular play in all good conscience. And so he said to the, the physician in his church, you know, thank you for the offer, but I really cannot take them. So the physician was taken back. Well, why pastor? Why can't you take, you know, the tickets? Because, you know, I see that you're working hard, and so you need to, you know, to relax, to relax yourself. And so the pastor said to the physician, he said, listen, you are a good physician, aren't you? In fact, you are a great surgeon as well. And so when you operate on people, what you do is that you scrub your hands meticulously until they are very clean. And so you would not dare to operate on a patient with dirty hands, won't you? And of course, the physician would say, of course, I would not think about doing that because uh, I would put the patient at great risk. In fact, if I do not scrub my hands and wash my hands properly, in fact, I could harm that patient. And so that patient could even die as a result of, of me not being properly cleansed. And so he said to the physician, he said, listen, I am your pastor and I am a servant of Christ. You deal with physical bodies, but I deal with souls. I deal with human souls, and they are precious, and I dare not do service with uh, a dirty life. Your position, you will not do service with dirty hands. I'm a pastor. I cannot do service with a dirty life. Folks, I tell you, this should be our attitudes uh, tonight as well. We're living in a time, everywhere you go, there are signs that are posted. Wash hands before entering. In fact, some places you'll be monitored. And if you fail to wash your hands, you would refuse service. You will not be able to enter into that establishment because it has become mandatory that you wash your hands that you sanitize your hands. Because why? It is because you could be putting others at risk, you see, all right? And so that is why in this time of COVID that you always are hearing about sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. Wear masks and sanitize because you do not want to, to, to have the risk of others, all right, contracting the COVID virus. And so folks, uh, Two, there is a virus that is more deadly than the corona because the corona can only touch our physical bodies. That is as much as it can do. 
you might perhaps uh, become sicker uh, with it, uh, all right? And in a bad instance, uh, some people could die from the coronavirus. Uh. But folks, there is something that is more destructive, uh, and that is sin, you see? And so, as we are taking literally the washing of hands very seriously, and the wearing of masks very seriously, and all of the protocols that we should observe during this time of the coronavirus. Folks, we must also take our spiritual lives seriously and make sure that we are cleansed thoroughly. We are cleansed so folks that the Spirit of God could operate in our lives in power and anointing and we too can be a help to people and not a harm to, per, to persons. As born well again Christians, folks, we are the servants of the living God. And so we may not all teach or preach or all sing, but we can all serve the Lord in some form. As servants of the Lord, God requires that we be clean. If we are to be any good in this world, we must be clean. Much more folks than being talented, we must be clean. Much more than being gifted, we must be clean. Much more than being great, that we must be clean. What kind of vessels does God use? I ask you folks tonight. Well, there's only one kind of vessel that God could really use for his glory and honor. And that is clean vessels. Praise God. Bear that in mind, folks. Clean vessels is what God can use. Oftentimes, when we come before the Lord in prayer, He will reveal to us areas that need to be cleansed. You see? And so, while today there are many detergents that are used for cleansing, always we have to wash our hands to tell us, all right, and wash it properly using proper soaps and so on, proper sanitizers, they recommend that 70% at, it must at least be um, of uh, alcohol content for it to really cleanse you properly, all right? But folks, with all that is offered today, all the sanitizers and all the soaps that is offered today, it cannot wash the heart of sin. There's only one thing that can wash our hearts of sin, and that is the blood of Jesus. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, it is the blood that cleanses us from all sins. And if we were to confess our sins, He will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Praise God. Now, secondly tonight, the other tragedy that, uh, that we want to, to look at it's found in verses 44, and I read it to you again. And they shall lay the even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knowest not the time of thy visitation. What was tragic as well, folks, is that the people did not recognize God's time. You know, we are conscious of time. The world is conscious of time. Almost every person today wears a watch. We look at, at our time regularly. Your cell phones and so on. Even in church, we are pressed with time. I constantly have to look at the clock because we are allowed a certain time for, you know, for, for, for our, our services and so on. And so in your work, you're looking at time to, go, to get to work on time, lunch time, then to leave home school or whatnot. You see, we are very, very conscious of time, all right? And time is something that is very, very precious. But folks, unfortunately, there is a time that few people look at, and that is God's time. We look at our time. We look at our time for leisure our time for pleasure. We look at our time for school. We look at our time to go to work. We look at our time to get dressed and, you know, we have time for everything. But folks, I think we have left out the most important time, and that is God's time. God's time. 
I want you all to know, folks, that Ecclesiastes says there's a time for everything, you know. There's a time for everything, but there's also a time for God. And it is really a shame that the people did not recognize God's time and a time for God. And that is a great tragedy that I see today. I see it happening in our world today, folks, uh, as we are giving our time and our energy and our resources to so many things. Uh, folks, at the same time, you see that very few are taking and making time for God. You see how little time that we give out, we give to the Lord. In fact, we try to squeeze out as much time for God than anything else in our daily calendar, in our weekly calendar, even our yearly calendar. Some people are telling you when it comes time for God, we want to give Him the least out of everything. We want to give him some people, we want to give him what is remaining or what we could spare, if we could spare. I cannot tell you how many people that I have been inviting to come to church and uh, one of the things that they will say, Pastor, you know, if I have the time. And so I'll tell them, okay, you know, what about Sunday morning? And immediately they will tell you, oh, look, you know, they already have plans. I'll tell you about Sunday night and then they tell you they have plans. But then, okay, but what about Wednesday night? I have, I have something coming up, uh, and so on. And if it don't work out, then I will try to come. You see what is happening, folks? Uh, is that when it comes to God uh, and to giving God time, uh, we make excuses about doing it. You see, and uh, that is so, so unfortunate. Uh, and so, Jesus said to the people, as he rode into Jerusalem. He said, listen, you do not know the time. You do not know God's time. You do not know the time of your visitation. The most important time has come to you and you don't recognize it. In other words, the greatest opportunity has presented itself and you don't see it. You are blinded to that opportunity that is right before you. Salvation is right in front of you and you don't see it. Eternal life is right in front of you and you don't see. A chance to escape hell is right in front of you and you don't see. An opportunity to have your sins forgiven is right before you and you don't see. An opportunity here to know the true and living God, to have a relationship with Him and you don't see it. You are blinded. There's a you have you have made time for everything, but this time. Here it is, that God has visited you. He is visiting you with salvation. Visiting you here with the forgiveness of sins. But you don't see it. You are blinded to that. And folks, this is what is happening to our world today. Is that people do not see the time of their visitation. They do not see the opportunity that God has given to them. And many folks, unfortunately, will live to regret it. Folks, Many will come to that place and say, you know what, I had an opportunity to know God and I never took it. I had an opportunity to have my sins forgiven and I never took it. I had an opportunity to be saved and I never took it. I had an opportunity to be born again and I never took it. And what a fool that I am today. The greatest opportunity has presented itself right at my doorstep, right in front of me. Here was Jesus, right in front of them, folks. But they were too blind to see it. They were blinded by their own things. They were blinded by their own ambitions. They were blinded by their own activities, you see. And they did not see the day of visitation. The great day that was prophesied by the prophets long ago. Folks, that they have been waiting for. It came and they missed it. It's not really something really, really sad. That is tragic. The greatest tragedy for, for folks of this world today, and for those that are listening to me tonight, your greatest tragedy is to miss this minute, to miss this hour, because this hour is the hour of your visitation. It is the hour of your salvation. It is the hour of your deliverance. It is the time to be saved. It is the time to be delivered. It is the time to be rescued. It is the time to have your sins forgiven. It is the time to be healed, folks. It is the time to receive the gift of eternal life. 
And if you miss it, folks, I tell you, it would be your greatest uh, tragedy. Biblical prophecies were being fulfilled right before their very eyes. Look at Isaiah chapter 62, verses 11. It says, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your Savior comes. And Zechariah 9 and verses 9 says, See, your King comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coat, on the foal of a donkey. Folks, here it was a prophecy was fulfilled. They were waiting on it, and when it happened, they could not see. They could not see that it was exactly as was prophesied by the prophet Zechariah, exactly what was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. Folks, was filled before the very eyes, and they did not see it. It is unfortunate. The donkey that Jesus rode on, the Bible tells us never man sat on it before. In other words, it was not a trained or a tamed animal. Alright? It needed to be broken in before somebody could ride it properly. But look at that animal. That animal being untrained, untamed, yet submitted itself to Jesus. That Jesus could sit on that animal and that animal gave no trouble. That animal followed gracefully the wishes of our Savior Jesus. You know what is really sad folks? That oftentimes you see that animals are more subjected all right to the will of God than human beings. I tell you that is really 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 sad. Not only do we find this here, but we find it in other places in the Bible. Because you could recall also when Noah was building the ark and uh, Noah warned the people of the flood that was going to come, judgment that was going to come, and Noah begged that they would have come into the ark. But folks, nobody listened. They were so stubborn. They were so hardened that they refused to come in. But when God, folks, I tell you, when God told Noah, listen, Noah, get them animals, male and female, of every species, and let them come into the ark, we see animals coming in. Wild animals, tigers and lions and leopards and elephants, even snakes and so on, were coming into the ark, folks. But man, man will not come in. They mock and they ridicule until it was uh, too late. There are many things about the entry of Jesus as he was heading up to the temple that pointed him, pointed clearly that he indeed was the Messiah. There were signs all around them. I've just mentioned to you a few, but the people still did not get it. In verses 41 of our text, and when he was come here, he begged, he held the city. Look how Jesus watched over Jerusalem. He looked over the city. And what did he do? He wept. He cried. His heart was broken. I could ride an animal on team. That animal did my will. Never made no complaint. And yet look at the people. The people would not, folks, receive him as the Messiah that God had sent. You see, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. But folks, he did not just only weep for those people. As I shared with you, there may have been about two or three million persons that came out to that Palm Sunday. It was a big event, annual event. People would make pilgrimage as people make today to come into to Jerusalem to offer up their sacrifices. It was the time of the Passover. But folks, Jesus wept for more than those people. He would weep for the future of Jerusalem. He would weep for the future of the world. Because Jesus made a statement, a prophetic statement about what will happen. For the day shall come, in verses 43, if you're following your Bibles, he made a prophetic statement. He said the days 
shall come upon thee, that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee on every side. You see? Not one stone were left upon another. Jesus made that prophetic statement. And he wept because he knew the future of Jerusalem. He knew the impending destruction that would come upon Jerusalem. He knew the impending destruction that will come upon the world. And so Jesus said, if you had even known only on this day what would bring you peace, what will save you, what will deliver you, if you knew the day of your salvation, but he said, it is hidden from your eyes because you fail to recognize the time of God's coming. The time of God's deliverance is here, but you have rejected it. And so what will happen? Destruction will come. Folks, this is prophetic in so many, many ways. As I said, Jesus was not just speaking this to those that were there on that first Palm Sunday. He was speaking to this entire world, folks. You see, today is our day of visitation. Don't you do it, somebody? The Bible tells 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 2 that today is the day of salvation. Today is a day of visitation from the Lord. It has been 2,000 years that this day of visitation has been extended. God has, by His grace, has been extended this day of visitation. But prophetically, folks, just as it happened to those in Jerusalem that day, because as you know, the temple was destroyed. You agree what had happened. History records it wouldn't have been long. Just a matter of folks of a couple of decades and that very temple that the people boasted about, it was broken down, you see. But Jesus had something more in mind, folks. Jesus was talking about the great destruction that is up ahead, that is coming upon this world. That is what Jesus had in mind. When he cried, when he wept, it was not just for those few million persons. It was for the millions and billions of people upon planet Earth, um, folks, um, who God has offered to them a day of visitation. 2,000 years of, of visitation of God's grace. And what has happened, folks? Uh, many people are blinded and lost here. Many people are blinded to this day of grace and this age of grace uh, that God has given unto us. Uh, but folks, um, failure... Failure will result later on in great destruction because you all know what is coming ahead of us, folks. Ahead of us, folks, is great, great destruction and great disaster. So, folks, I wonder this evening how many people would open their hearts and open their eyes to the Lord and to the day of their visitation. All the signs are around us, a sure and indicator that the coming of the Lord is close at hand. Just today, two gentlemen came to deliver materials for our uh, reconstruction of the, uh, of the auditorium and, and so on. And so I had the privilege of talking to both of them about the signs of the times and where we are right now, where we, where we are headed. Folks, and I could see the great conviction of God upon their lives and, and I trust that people would really open up their eyes. These are not ordinary times now. These are times of biblical prophecies being fulfilled, folks. And I fear just as the people of Jerusalem missed the time of their visitation, millions and billions upon planet Earth is missing this time of visitation, folks. But I wonder if we are recognizing God's timing in the world today. Are we prepared for the coming of the Lord? Listen, as I close very shortly, Jeremiah chapter 7, 8 rather, and verse 7 tells us, even the stalk in the sky knows for appointed seasons, and the dove and the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migration, but my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. I tell you, it is something else today, folks, that the animals and the birds will sense danger and they will seek safety. But man, as it was so defiant, 
Danger is all around. But we will defy it, folks. We will say, it cannot touch me. I am immune to it. Living very foolishly and very presumptuously. But folks, there is a danger that nobody would be immune to. It will come upon the planet Earth, folks, and it will touch every soul upon the planet. And folks, I tell you, and no one will be able to save you. No one will be able to help you, folks. The only one now that can save you from that is Jesus Christ. In closing, let me share with you a story. In 2004, the short shoreline of Sri Lanka was devastated by a horrifying and massive tsunami. The destruction caused in just a few minutes was unimaginable. Close to 40,000 lives were lost. That's a lot of people by that tsunami. And thousands were left homeless. I mean, homes are literally wiped out, gone, just gone. And as the building process began soon after, one of the strangest discoveries that prior to this tsunami, animals and wildlife reserves close to the sea instinctively sensed the danger that was approaching. And as a result, what did these wildlife, what did these animals and these birds and so on, what did they do, folks? They moved to higher ground, further inland, and they escaped the killer waves of that tsunami. But unfortunately, folks, human beings, human beings, I tell you, sense no danger at all. They were not observant. They did not really would even to say, well, look, caring about anything. Nothing will, will happen to us. We are all good. You see, animals seeing and sensing the danger ran for refuge. But human beings, folks, I tell you, it is the last that will even think about, about doing that. Today, there is great danger up ahead planet Earth. I tell you, folks, if you're not seeing it, we are no better than these people that Jesus said, the time of your salvation is right in front of you and you're blind to see it. If this world does not see what is happening today, we are no better. And I think Jesus is weeping as he wept for Jerusalem. He is weeping folks for us right now. Because, listen, regardless to what Messiah is that you might be listening to today, and they might telling us everything going to get back to normal. Folks, everything is going to pass as it always has passed. And everything is going to be alright. Who are you listening to? What psychics are you listening to? What prophets are you listening to, folks? I say, listen. God has said in His word. And His word will stand forever. Heaven will pass. Earth will pass. But God's word will not pass away. Matthew 25 and verses 35 is very clear on that folks. And anybody today that is seriously looking at the Bible and reading the Bible and studying the Bible will know folks that we are in unprecedented times and will know that these are the days of the coming of our Savior Jesus Christ and will know that the rapture is about to take place and will know folks that the Antichrist is about to rise upon planet Earth and take over world dominance. If you're studying your Bible and reading your Bible, these are not ordinary days. These are extraordinary days. COVID, folks, is just a platform that is setting the stage of all what I'm sharing with you tonight. Setting the stage of the Antichrist, folks. Setting the stage of the mark of the beast, which the Bible tells us without it, a man will not buy, he cannot sell. We are doomed. This is, this is just, folks, a shadow. COVID is a shadow. What is happening is a shadow of the real thing. Because as you all know, we are coming to a place very soon that you will not be able to travel if you don't take the, the vaccine. You will not be able to go to work just now without taking the vaccine. 
Our children may not even go to, be able to go to school if we don't take the vaccine. In other words, you will be able to do almost nothing if you do not take the vaccine. It is a shadow of when it becomes mandatory upon planet Earth that every man must receive that mark, the Bible tells us. The mark of the beast. Yes. It is here. The technology is here. So there is no reason to say that that is far-fetched. What has been prophesied years ago, folks, uh, it has right before our eyes. You see, we just have to open up our eyes and see what is happening and prepare ourselves for the coming of our Savior, Jesus. Church, brethren, it won't be long now. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. And do not become sidetracked at all. With all the hardships that you're going through, it, folks, just know that this world is not our home. All right? We are not citizens here. We are sojourners. We are strangers. We are just passing through. Just a little while now, folks, we have to wait. Just a little while, and our Lord will come. All right? And we just got to be ready for it. When he comes, folks, clean vessels. Amen. Praise God. He wants the church. It's a picture of what the church should be. What Jesus did then, it's a picture of what the church Jesus set a precedence about what the church supposed to be. The physical temple, yes, but also these temples, our bodies, are the temples of the Spirit of God. Where folks, we must have nothing in our bodies that defile, defile the temples. It could be attitudinal. You have to look at our attitude, folks. It can be probably even blatant disregard to the Word of God. It could be perhaps blatant sin, you know. Blatant sin. I mean, you know that there, uh, there is sin in your life. You see, very blatant. And what Jesus said, listen, we got to get that cleansed. That got to be cleansed. And notice how passionate Jesus was about cleansing the temple on, on, on Monday. Very, very passionate. First time you're seeing the Lord being so compassionate. Because all the time you're seeing Jesus, folks, I tell you, he's been gracious, he's been kind to people feeding people, embracing them. But now you see a different side of Jesus. You've been seen a side, folks, of love. You've been seen a side of mercy. But on this particular Monday, you have seen a different side of Christ. You have seen a side, folks, that people have never seen before. They never expected that Christ will do something like that. That he will make a, 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 a whip, all right, of cords, and that he will drive out those that were profaning the temple. You can see how passionate that Jesus was about temple cleansing. And folks, we have to be passionate about temple cleansing as well. We cleanse our bodies as best as we can. We shower. We take regular showers. We cleanse our outside. Again, we do everything to make sure that the outside is clean. All right? But folks, what is more important is the inside. The inside, God is looking at the inside. Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the inside. And God can only use clean vessels. Folks. Some people think that they can get away because they are very talented. So because I'm talented, that will save me. You think it's going to save you, folks? Folks, mm -mm. there's only one people who have seen heaven and those that are washed in the blood of Christ. Those who have been cleansed. Cleanse in the blood of Christ. That's the only people you have seen ever. Those that are cleansed the blood of Jesus. Our talent can't save us. Our ability can't save us. Our money can't save us, folks. Even your good looks can't save you neither. It is only the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God. So what is the Lord interested in this week? What is interested in right now, this very minute, is that we are cleansed and washed in His blood. Praise God. Hallelujah. I hope tonight that we get the message. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we are thankful for all that we are learning, dear, dear Lord. Hallelujah. How important it is to have the temple cleansed. Not just to have reverence and respect for the physical house that we worship in, dear Father. But dear Lord, this body of ours has now become the temple of the Spirit of God. As 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us, knowing not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you were brought with a price, and you are not your own. And so therefore, dear Lord, we ought to be making regular checks. 
of our temple, regular sanitizing of our temple, regular washing of our, our temples. So that, dear Father, that we could uh, be vessels that could bring praise and honor to the glory of the Lord. Father, we thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for today, it's a day of your visitation. It's a visitation of grace. And it has lasted for 2,000 years. But we cannot take it for granted. Because that day, Jesus was there. The time of their visitation. But he wasn't going to be there like that. Opportunity was not going to be there forever. As the door of Noah was shut. It, it opened for all that time. All that time. 100 years it was building. It was open. But the door had to be shut. The door had to be shut. And grace has to be shut. There's no question. The day of grace can cannot continue forever. It is only for a limited time. And we know, Father, that that door, the day of grace, is about to be shut. It's about to be shut. The church age is about to come to an end, dear Father. Lord, the time of judgment is up ahead. As Jesus prophesied, the time of destruction will come upon Jerusalem. No stone will be left upon another. And it happened, dear Lord, within 40 years, it happened, dear Father, that temple was destroyed, was broken down. But dear Lord, we know that you had something more in mind. You had about destruction, more than just a physical temple. You had the destruction will come upon planet Earth, dear Father. That time is upon us, dear Lord. We pray that no one that is listening tonight, dear Father, would be left out. But their hearts will be opened and they have received the gift of eternal life in Jesus' name. You are here tonight and you are listening as well and you say, Pastor, here is my hand. I want to be washed in the blood of Christ because the door is open right now and I don't want that door to be closed on me and I'll be turned into everlasting destruction like the foolish virgins. The door was shut on them. It was shut on them. They could not get it. No matter how hard they tried, it was shot on them. It was shot on them. You can see this prayer right now. Those of you viewing and others, you can see this prayer right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day of salvation and this day of grace. And I need your grace. I need forgiveness of sin. I repent of my sin right now. And I ask forgiveness. And invite Jesus into my life as my Savior and to be the Lord of my life from today forward. Thank you for giving my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Praise God. God bless you, viewers. Amen. For viewing the broadcast Friday evening, we're having a special Good Friday service. It's 7 o'clock, 7 p.m. All right. And we invite you to come out and join with us. And if not, uh, you can view online. And then uh, this coming Sunday, especially Easter Sunday, we have two services again, 9 a.m. and also 6 30 p.m. We are observing also the Lord's table. The Sunday morning says extra special, praise God. I know our folks here have been working hard for some special presentations that are going to be taking place on Friday, Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Praise the Lord as the Lord tarry, the place to be is here in the house of the Lord with your family. Come and experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ this Easter. So I bid our viewers good night. Appreciate your comments. God bless you.